And it's, uh, wait, wait one second, we're going to start with Arthur Lupia, I should say that, maybe. Um, he's going to be our first um, keynote speaker. And I also want to thank you because he is actually a very busy guy, I think, but he still was very generous with trying to help us, for example, getting money for the MTS pre registrations. And we were actually surprised how helpful you wanted to be for us. And it was really nice because we know how much stuff you have to do. So we're very thankful. Um, and so it's up to you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for being here. Um, I want to thank the organizers of this event. Um, what I'm hoping for uh, from this conference is a discontinuity. All right. So a lot of people uh, study continuous processes, or they study complex things with the assumption that it's continuous. That you know you can find a simple regression coefficient or a simple causal arrow that will describe everything. But sometimes you have discontinuities. You have um, things are operating in a certain way until a particular time, and then they change. And what you saw before that time is is, is slightly is is is, is um, very different than what you see after. And I'm hoping that that's what we do today, uh, a discontinuity. Um, because for me, the, the dependent variable of interest is quality of life. Uh, that is, in the social sciences, we have this amazing capacity to increase quality of life. Uh, there are people all over the world, most of whom we can scarcely imagine in a beautiful, you know, when we're together in a beautiful place like this. Um, but people who desperately need the social sciences to reconcile their actions and their aspirations, to reconcile the hopes that they have or the, the urgent crises that they face uh, with the co decision capacity that they have in that day. And what is happening at this conference, although it may seem remote from that, what I want to try and do is convince you that it, it isn't that remote. So I want to thank you for being here and for being interested in this topic, because I believe that this topic is the key to having the social sciences be of great value. So an outline for what is to come. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on how I think about these things, uh, just you know, uh, truth and labeling. Uh, and then we'll ask a question about whether and how our work is valuable. We may assume that it is, but, but is it? What would make our work valuable to um, people who might want to use it? and people who might want to fund it. Um, what are some challenges that we face uh, in creating this value? What are the opportunities that we have uh, in front of us? And then finally, I'll, I'll, I'm just, this is the spoiler alert, uh, that the value of social science, uh, it really is up to us. It's not up to someone else. It's not up to a far off building. It's not, for those of you who are younger, it's not up to people who are my age uh, in isolation. Uh, it's up to all of us. So my, I'll just give you my, my prejudices, because we all have some. My background is, is actually in mathematics. So um, these are uh, actual images from things that I have published. Um, and this is one way of looking at the world. Um, an interesting thing about this is when you um, are in mathematics and you want to make a claim, a claim to know, is it OK that, that I'm standing here? Yeah. yeah. Um, if you want to make a claim in mathematics that something has caused something else or something that's related to something else, you're expected to offer a proof. You don't just walk in a room and say, hey, I found that you know, uh, people can vote as if they knew a lot when they don't. They thought, we'll, we'll prove that under what conditions. If you walked into a math uh, classroom or a, um, a conference and you made a claim without coming in with a proof, people would wonder why you were there. Like, what are you doing here? Now, What's interesting about a proof is, is a proof isn't about a, the person who did it. What a proof is about, if, if you write it the right way, is it allows another person to see your thought process. It allows another person to start where you started, to see the steps that you took, and to get to the conclusion that you've reached. A proof is not an individual thing. It's a community thing. And if you've written it the right way, by the, the time the reader gets to the end of the proof, they too can produce the result. That's one of the great things about mathematics, I think. At the end of the day, uh, what it can help us do is, is go beyond our understanding 
And if we write it the right way, we can take other people with us. So at the end, the proof isn't about who wrote it. The proof is for the community. It's about the community. The logic is available to anyone. So, so that's my prejudice going in. Uh, the things that I work on have influenced how I think about open science. Uh, I study how people make decisions when they don't know very much, which conveniently is always. Um, I also study how to build coalitions around very complicated ideas, uh, how you communicate things. Um, and over the last 10 or 15 years, I've done a lot of work with science organizations on how to, cr how to communicate what we know in ways that people can use it while trying to retain its truth value. Right? So that, that was a rewarding experience, but along the way, you're forced to grapple with, well, what do we actually know? What is it that we actually know? I know what we publish. I know the types of things that can get published. But what is it that we actually know? And the reason that this matters is because when you start thinking about communication, um, there's this question of the person who hears you. And there's the question of what do they do with the information that uh, you're giving them. And we are in two states of the world. One state of the world is no one cares about what we do. We just write things in journals, and we make each other happy, and we tell each other stories. But outside of the, the small groups that read our journals, it actually is inconsequential. So that's one state of the world. The other state of the world is actually the work that we do somehow, somehow reaches the people we are writing about. Somehow, yeah, I got to go back here. OK. Uh, somehow, is there a place where I can be or not be? That's a good place. OK. <laughs> All right. Um, it's the, the people who ostensibly are helped by science. Um, what is it that they hear? What information do they receive? So for me, this is an abstraction. As I got into the business of advising organizations, there was a point at which governments started asking me for advice on how to, how to try and bring science in to help them deal with important problems. The, the most important thing, I, I think, probably, for me, one of the biggest events where I had this is, uh, this, is, um, this was in Colombia, uh, where they had a 60-year civil war. One of the people in the picture is me, and one of the other people in the picture is the president of Colombia. And the, it, it turns out when you've had a civil war for 60 years, peace can be hard to talk about, uh, because uh, many things have happened. Uh, many, uh, people have many grievances. And the question is, how do you get from a situation of conflict to a situation of peace? The president of the country was very interested in doing that, but it turned out to be difficult. And he asked me and, and some other folks about what social science knew. Right? So there were moments where uh, this, this gentleman uh, was asking questions like, what should I do? And it's interesting at that moment to know that the answer that you give is going to affect people's lives, thousands of people's lives, millions of people's lives. I've uh, been in situations where I've spoken to leaders of a number of countries where that question is asked. And so now, what we know is no longer a cute thing about what's in a journal or not. It's actually impacting people's lives. And so that's, that's why I care about open science. That, these are the stakes, I think, that we're all involved with. Because if we're in the state, the state of the world where no one reads our research, then this doesn't matter. But I think the reason that you make the journey to come to a place like this is because you think it does matter, right? And if it does matter, then the question is, what are we telling people? Now, now this story ended well. Right there, Colombia is now more peaceful than it was before, right? And 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 social science was was part of how this happened, um, but it does you know it doesn't always end this way, and I'll show you some other cases a little later on. But anyways, so here's my that's my perspective, and this is why I'm here. So now let's talk about transparency, research transparency, and the public value of science. I think they are they are one in the same. Okay, so what is our mission in science? And I would, uh, one way that I try to describe our, our mission, I want to speak for you, but mission for people that, that I know in this field, is, is one of clarity. What we're trying to do is, is we're trying to offer people uh, a better understanding of the relationship between things they can see and things they can do. Right? And, and to understand that, we have to go beyond what we can see and think about counterfactuals and think about what other people have done and compare across time, across space, uh, simulate, experiment, analyze, conceptualize. Right? That th these are the things that we do. Uh, we do them for students. Right? Some of what we do when we try to clarify complex things or when we try to show people that complex things actually have a pretty simple principle that, that could be useful to focus on, uh, they help students. Right? Uh, they help teachers. I mean, we know that. Right? Uh, clarity can be a, a 
a great thing for a lot of people. So I think that what we're about is clarity. Right? You can have clarity through simplification, or you can have clarity through complexity. Against clarity through simplification would be, here's a complex phenomena, but I've teased out a core set of principles that if you understand them, you can do something in a wide range of circumstances and achieve your aspirations. Or you can have clarity through complexity. You see this thing, it's a little more complicated than you thought it was, and so we might want to make contingent plans for some of the complications. Right? So how is it that we provide clarity? So I want to be a little bit crass. We sell things. We scientists sell things. And by sell things, I mean we expect somebody to pay somebody for this. We might get a salary, somebody else might get paid, but we expect. So what are the things that we sell? We sell two main things. One is we sell information. That can be through the things that we observe, through the categories that we create, through the, uh, analyst, the, analyst, the, the analyses we do on the categories, or through the interpretations of the analysis. Right? We, we, we uh, create information, and we create you know, through the data, and meaning through the analyses. These are the two things that we sell. Right? I mean, we can sell them in classrooms, we can sell them in books, we can sell them in videos, but this is ultimately what we sell. A challenge for us, a, people, a challenge for people who, in effect, sell information and meaning to others, is that the marketplace for these two products has completely transformed within our lifetime. There's this thing called electronically enabled communication. It manifests as the internet and social media and things of that nature. And we have gone from a situation where most people lack the ability to obtain information about pretty much everything to a situation where at the touch of a finger you can get information on so many topics. That has been a change in our, our lifetime. So the reason that this matters is people who would have been in a room like this at a university, let's say 50 years ago, if they were doing a scientific study in a field, there was a good chance that that was the first study on that topic that had ever been done. And if you gave it to someone who was, who was you know, uh, working in that area, they might have said, oh, a scientific study on what I do? That's amazing. I've never seen this before. Right? And now we are in a circumstance where it's not just scientists. There's so many people who claim to know things and who put their claims on the internet, some on Twitter, some in journal articles, some in videos, some on blogs. But now there is basically more information that, than we could ever process. That's a challenge for us. That's a challenge for us in science. Um, it's a challenge for us because people start asking questions about, all right, but why do I need you now? There are all these people on the internet who will give me information for free. Why do I need your journals? Why do I need to pay your salaries? Why do I need to write grants for you? Because all these people know things on the internet. That's certainly asked in my country, right, when, when people want to know about should we fund science? Right? Should we fund social science? Right? Some questions come to mind. And the questions are, why should we pay for what you do? Because I can get a lot of this information for free. Right? Particularly if you're in the social sciences, there's no limit to the number of people who claim to be experts on the economy. Hey, I, I have a job. I, I've seen a dollar bill. I'm an expert on economics. Hey, I voted last week. I'm going to write an op-ed on voting. Right? There, there's no end to the number of experts. And there's also trust. Right? Why should we trust you? Aren't all of you academics just self-interested? Aren't most of you just liberals who use subscripts once in a while? Right? Uh, so there are real questions about these things. Right? And so the question is, well, I know you'll think about that one. Right? Um, so how do we answer these questions? And my, my um, uh, reflection on this is I like to answer these questions as honestly as I can and as aggressively as I can, because I think there is real value in the social sciences. But it's only if we think about it in a certain way. So let's ask this question. What is the value of our research? Where does the value to others come from? I'm not talking about the value to us right now, getting publications, getting jobs, and so forth. We'll talk about that. Right? But right now, I'm talking about the value of our research to people who aren't at universities. Okay? So um, here's a way to think about it. People make decisions. And when you make a decision, what's the basis of it? The basis is usually an evaluation. I evaluate something. What do I evaluate to make a decision? I evaluate past actions. That's all I can do. Right? Even if I make a simulation or conjecture about the future, all of the data that I'm using for that conjecture must have come from the past. 
even if it came from the present, the present immediately becomes the past. Right? So everything upon which I base a decision comes from, from the past. So evaluations, those are, on, those are the things on which we base decisions. And one of the things about evaluations for so many of the decisions that are made in society is there's, there's an endless number of them. Everyone can produce evaluations. Uh, people, cartoon animals, emojis, uh, memes. There are all kinds of ways to evaluate things. So now when people are making decisions, particularly serious ones, they're asking the question, well, which evaluation should we believe? Now there are some criteria uh, that help people sort through claims. Okay? I'll give you two really basic uh, criteria. One is credibility. We would like to uh, rely on claims that are credible. What makes an evaluation credible? It has some quality that makes it believable or trustworthy. There is something about it. Okay? So credibility is something we like uh, an, a, a claim to have. We can talk a bit about where credibility comes from in a moment. The other is legitimacy. Right? And credibility and legitimacy, I want to make sure we, we think of them as distinct. By legitimate, I mean uh, you have come up with it in accordance with recognized or accepted principles. So legitimacy is really important. If you and I are having a conversation and we disagree, the question is, what do we do with that disagreement? If I understand how it is you have come to your conclusion and I can see, well, I can see how, you, how you've done it, I'd say, well, given your assumptions or given where you've come from or given a life experience you have, I can see how someone would come to that conclusion that can be really helpful for me. If we are ever going to try and reconcile and come to an understanding, being able to see someone else's point of view and understand that path, legitimize it, validate it, right, that's a really important way to build coalitions, to build understanding. Right? So legitimacy can matter as well. So I want, to, I want to put forward the proposition that credibility and legitimacy are two things that are valuable to have in evaluations. If we are trying to make claims about how things work or what they are, it's good to have credibility and legitimacy. And so one answer to the question, what is the value of our research, is that it is a potential source for credible and legitimate evaluations. But what we have in science is the potential for that. The actuality is something different. So Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winner, I am old enough to have actually met Feynman when I was very young, because I was at Caltech, I met him at a party. Um, you know, he, did, he wouldn't have remembered. Um, but he gave a commencement address that I did not attend, uh, because at this age I was not reading uh, academic journals, I was reading Spider-Man. Um, but at this, this address, which you can, still, you can still read about, he talked about science and, and what, makes, what gives science its integrity. We talked about scientific integrity corresponding to a type of utter honesty. Okay. Um, leaning over backwards, and, and what, is it, what, what, hap what he says next is really critical. So what science is about is giving all of the information to help others judge the value of your contribution, not just the information that leads to, uh, to a judgment in a particular direction. Right? That was the key to science for Feynman. Right? You put it all out there, you draw a conclusion, but if you put it all out there, other people can see do they agree with it, or do they have some legitimate reason for drawing another conclusion? Right? So another way to think about the value of our research, right, another way to think about that, uh, people have cameras up, so I'm just going to pause for a sec to so make sure you can get a snapshot of it, good, is that it's a source for credible and legitimate evaluations. And the way that it does that is it allows us to have a greater degree of honesty in evaluation. That is the permission that we have in science. But cue up the dark cloud. Um, there can be a, a difference between the potential and the actuality. And that's where all of us come in today. That's where the discontinuity is possible. What is the dark cloud? The dark cloud is today, many researchers have strong incentives to discover and publish. And that's really important. Discovery is important. Publications are important. We have weak incentives to explain how the discoveries emerged. Right? What we get credit for are the claims that go viral. What we get credit for are the claims that we can publish in journals, many of which care about impact factors, right? Or many of which care about uh, validating a particular methodological uh, uh, perspective in which they already have a stake. I'm not saying these are bad things, I'm just saying this is the incentive system, okay? 
we are all part of an academic advancement ecosystem, and it's important to be honest about what this is. So, what are the properties of the academic advancement ecosystem? Okay? So, there are things that, that are part of this ecosystem that we like, like salaries. I don't know how many of you would turn down a salary, right? but, but salaries are something that, that people like. Uh, people like health insurance. Sorry? They need it. They need health insurance, right? And in some countries, uh, health insurance is not easily available. Uh, people also like grants, right? In fact, there are lots of things that people like in academics. And so if you play the game the right way, there are all kinds of things they can have. And all this and more can be yours, right, if you play the game a certain way, right? Uh, publishing and, and, and making claims that, that, that people repeat. Um, but the same ecosystem has a problem because if we have high incentives to publish and low incentives to explain what we've done, then these current practices threaten the meaning of an individual study. If I, if I run 50 regressions and I show you one, and the one regression is the one that happens to have a significant relationship between a dependent and independent variable of interest, and I don't show you the 49 others that don't have this relationship, what does my claim mean? What does it mean? Um, it, it not only threatens the meaning of individual studies, it threatens the meaning of a scientific consensus. If an entire literature, if an entire journal, if an entire discipline is built around publication bias, is built on p-hacking, right, is built on, uh, you know, um, selecting on the dependent variable, then what does a scientific consensus mean? And just to sort of make this a little more real, we know that there are scientific literatures where publication bias, p-hacking, selecting on the dependent variable are all uh, uh, selecting cases because they, they look a certain way, where they're prevalent. We know this, right? I'm not sure we've, we've documented a lot of disciplines where this doesn't occur. You guys ever heard of literature on climate change? In climate change, there's a consensus that the planet is warming and that human activity is largely responsible. And there's a consensus on that. And the cultural authority of those claims come not from any individual study, but they come from the scientific consensus. What if that literature had e-hacking and publication bias? Would that change the conversation? The, this academic ecosystem right, can have real consequences. I'm just, it's going to get a little darker, and then I promise I'm going to get, get it light. These consequences affect people's lives. So there's a book that I would recommend to you called Rigor Mortis. It is about how these problems of publication bias and p-hacking manifest in, in, in studies in biology that are related to cancer. And the consequences are horrific. So, so you have literatures, you have journals where only positive cases are published. People say, hey, there's a way to intervene on cancer, and, and there's, a, there's a consensus emerging in the literature that if we do this intervention, the cancer will be cured. So private and public center, sector entities now spend tens of millions of dollars trying to bring this to market. And they bring it out to hospitals, but it isn't working. For some reason, they can't get the result in the hospital that was published in the journals. And so they spend more, like, we must be doing something wrong. And then there are cases, well, wait a minute, let's go back and look at the literature. Oh, as it happens, so the null results were never published. And in fact, the failure was knowable. But now this isn't a clinical problem. Now tens of thousands of people, you know, have died or suffer because of the, this aspect of the academic ecosystem. So this is real. Right? The, if we live in the state of the world where no one pays attention to our research, then none of this matters. But if we live in the state of the world where people's quality of life depends on our research, this does matter. And you might say, well, that's biology and this is social science. Sometimes social science, sometimes the answer to a question can have the same effects. Right? So, so to me, the stakes are, are real and, and they're worth fighting for. The great thing is rooms like this. Right. The great thing is, is what we are talking about and doing right now. So we have an opportunity, right? And the opportunity is to integrate transparency incentives into the academic advancement ecosystem. 
For those of you who believe that we can just wipe away the academic advancement ecosystem, no. All right, we can talk about why that is, but, but that's not a short or medium term option. Right? But what we can do is understand enough about the ecosystem to try and integrate incentives for, for greater transparency, for greater integrity into what we're already doing. Okay? So let me talk to you about how you do this. Right? And to do this, I, I want to just take a little bit of a detour and talk about what, why transparency, why making this commitment is essential. I'm going to show you. So it turns out that science isn't the only way to know things. Science, I would argue, is one of four ways of knowing things. Okay, so I'm going to show you the other three. And then when we get to what science is, the question is, why would anyone pay attention to science rather than the other three? And the answer has to be transparency. But we'll get to that. So if I make a knowledge claim, so what does it, claim, what does it mean to claim to know something? When I claim to know something, I'm saying that a phenomena is or isn't in a category. Okay? So if I say that the city of Mannheim is in Germany, I'm saying the phenomenon known as the city of Mannheim is in the category of Germany, is not in the category of the United Kingdom. That's what a knowledge claim is. So how do we validate a knowledge claim? And there are four ways. They're, they are mutually exclusive, but not collectively exhaustive. So the first way is an appeal to metaphysics. We can say there are forces beyond our ability to perceive, beyond our ability to, to fully appreciate, that determine what is true and what is not determine what is good and what is bad. And in cultures around the world, appeals to metaphysics are, are used to validate knowledge claims. This is how we know certain things, certain moral truths, if you will, certain ethical truths. And, and this has been powerful throughout history. We'll get to science in a second. You might say this isn't as good as science. Just, just wait. Okay. So, so appeals to metaphysics are one way. Another way to validate a knowledge claim is through personal testimony say, yesterday this thing happened to me, and I felt this, and I saw this, and, and this is what it meant to me. And, and we can learn things from that. that. That is a way to validate a knowledge claim. You tell me a story, and I'm like, I, that's incredible that that happened to you. I couldn't imagine what, would ha what, would, what it would feel like if that happened to me, but I appreciate that it happened to you, and I've learned something from that. Right? So that's a way to validate a knowledge claim. We have appeals to metaphysics, appeals to, to personal testimony, and then we have everything in between. We'll call it the space between God and man, or culture, right? Through the arts, through literature, through architecture, through history, right? We take elements of the past and we condense it. We put it into a particular form and we use it to understand the present and the future. When you see a painting, when you see a Renaissance painting or a Baroque building or something like that, it tells you something about the past. It, 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 it takes that event and puts it in a very compressed form, but it is how we come to understand that event. If you see a religious painting like The Last Supper, right, that event had a lot of things going on that are not in that image. But that image now represents something about that story for everyone. Culture, references to history and things like that are a way that we understand things, are a way that we claim to know. So these are three ways of knowing. And then there's science. And here's what we get to do in science. We could say, I have an object in my hand. It's got a big red light over here. Oh, sorry, a big green light over here and a red button. I say, if I press this red button, the green light will go on. And you're like, that's really cool. What happens if I press the button? What happens if someone else has pressed the button? And if I follow the rules of science, if I make the steps clear, if I make my conceptualizations clear, if I make the steps of my analysis clear, if I make the steps of my interpretation clear, right, what I should be able to say is it doesn't matter who presses the button. It doesn't matter what your religious feelings are what your personal experiences have been, what your cultural affiliations are, right? Those matter, let's say, not at all, or, or maybe very minimally. Whoever presses this button, the light will go on, right? What science is about, kind of like when I talked about the proof, if we do it the right way, the truth of the knowledge claim, the validity of the knowledge claim, doesn't depend on the fact that we made it. It depends on the process, right? So what makes science not totally distinct, right, but distinctive uh, from the other ways of knowing is that a claim's validity depends less on whether you or I made it. It depends less on whether we have a particular cultural affiliation, right? It can be uh, true across cultural contexts. And that's the power of science. But we only have that if we have transparency. We only have that if we have openness and the potential for replicability and so forth. 
Okay, so now how do we take this and integrate it in the ecosystem? So I grew up on a farm, I grew up in the country, and one of the things I can tell you, I can talk about fishing, like I know things about fish. So, so if you want to catch fish, here's what doesn't work, begging the fish to come to you. Like, fish, I'm over here, I, I would like to eat now, I'd like, so please, that does not work. Um, what does work is if you go to where the fish are already swimming, you have more of a chance to get fish. Um, in academics, the fish swim to journals. Right? The, the fish who want to get tenure, the fish who want to get jobs, the fish who want to get grants, they swim to journals. Right? And so if we want to integrate transparency incentives into the academic ecosystems, I like to start with the journals. Right? Can we have journal editors require, propose uh, ideas uh, that will move in the direction of greater transparency? So um, if you, I don't know how many of you have been an editor. But the one thing I know about most journal editors is they feel that their job takes 25 hours a day and eight days a week. And so when you approach them with a new thing that will take up their time, they want nothing to do with it, even if it sounds good. So part of the strategy that I and others have tried to put forward in changing the ecosystem is providing, in effect, a plug and play infrastructure. That is, things that journal editors or other people in the, in the academic ecosystem can use to encourage or require, as they, as they choose for their, uh, for their community, uh, transparency uh, promoting standards, okay? So this has happened in a few ways. One of my first attempts at this with Colin Ellman uh, from Syracuse University uh, was DART. Uh, this was um, in political science. We went on a five-year listening tour. Uh, we, we listened to lots of journal editors and stakeholders. We talked about kind of, you know, the importance of science for quality of life. Colin is a qualitative person, I'm primarily quantitative, so we tried to sort of listen to it from a lot of different perspectives. And at the end of the listening tour, we, we, we asked, is there a non-empty intersection between what, all, what everybody wants, uh, in terms of what they want for their own science, that, that lends itself. So uh, this led to a joint statement of 28 uh, editors in the discipline, um, uh, 28 journals, to increase transparency requirements. Uh, this is a side note, I'll ask no questions about it. There was subsequently a petition uh, asking for this not to happen, for it to be delayed. Uh, just one summary statistic, the net effect of this petition was to increase by about 30% the number of journals that signed on to this. That is, the, 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 you know, people would call us and say, can we sign too? Anyways, so um, this was a template for something else though. We were, we, again, we were thinking about trying to get journal editors. Uh, we then, uh, Brian Nosick came to that meeting, Brian Nosick ran the Center for Open Science. I subsequently became the, became the chairman of the board for Center for Open Science, and they put forward the top guidelines. Does anybody know about the top guidelines? Okay, the top guidelines are a set of, of principles where, that you can put forward about, um, uh, that help to, to increase transparency, data sharing, replicability, and so forth. There are eight categories of standards. They include citation, make sure you cite data, right? Make sure you cite things that other people create. Um, Pre-registration, if, if that's appropriate for your academic community, uh, um, replications and so forth. So there are eight dimensions. You can choose three tiers. You can just ask people to disclose. You can ask people to require it. The transparency and openness promotion guidelines are a way to send a signal minimally or to actually change the culture of your journal. So it's coordinated by the Center for Open Science. Journals select their own level of implementation. Some can just say we support this, do whatever you're going to do. Others do a little bit more. What I can tell you is as of now, over 8,000 journals and organizations from across the disciplines have made this commitment. The first two were science and nature, arguably by some measures at the top of the academic ecosystem in terms of journals, and many other are part of this now. So many people are talking about openness and transparency and replication and so forth. Um, another thing, so, so this, is, this took a lot of work. There are other things you can do to change the ecosystem that are, in retrospect, criminally easy. So the next idea I'm going to show you, I can't take any credit for, but again, I, I think it's brilliant. Uh, before I show it to you, I don't know how, people are here from a lot of different countries. I can tell you, um, in the United States, when you're in the first or second grade, and you make a drawing that's pretty good, or you do good on a math test, one of the things the teacher will do is they, they'll pull out this strip of gold stars. You can get like 100 of them for 50 cents, and you put the gold star on your paper, it's just a little plastic gold star. And when you're six or seven years old, you run home and you show your parents, and then it's on the refrigerator, right? The gold star is like this amazing thing, and it costs nothing, but you've created this currency that drives seven and eight-year-old children wild. Well, it happens that the Center for Open Science uh, created 
its own version. That these are the badges, Center for Open Science badges. And what journals do now is they agree to, to, to use these. So if you and I publish in Journal X and Journal X is part of the Open Badges uh, program, if we, have, uh, if we had available data, if we had uh, research materials that are available, maybe the code, things like that, uh, if we had a pre-registered study, when people look at the table of contents in the journal or look at the title page, the gold stars are there. There are gold stars. And so as it happens now, more journals are accepting these. And we have, we, there's some data available. And even, now you have to remember, journals self-select into using the gold stars, so it's not random assignment. Even journals that self-select into this, you've seen a very significant increase, right, in, in these practices in those journals. This costs nothing to implement. You know, this cost, I don't know how much it costs to pay the graphic artist. That was basically how much this cost. So there are all kinds of ways to do this. There are others that are going to be talked about in the next two days. The point is, these are things that we can do right now. Okay? There are some challenges, though, and I want to be honest about it in terms of open science. Right, so the challenges. Uh, first, empirical evidence and experimentation. So uh, everything I've told you so far is true. I'm going to tell you something that sounds like it isn't true, but I promise you this happened. Um, I, was at, I was in Brooklyn uh, at, uh, you know, at, at a, an American uh, kind of social science uh, program. And there was a conversation about, should we do this transparency and replication? And, and isn't this just the quantitative people trying to take everything over? And you know, this is really bad. And I had one person at the table who incidentally had won a Nobel Prize in economics um, refer to us collectively as the transparency Taliban. Um, just, I, lo I gave him points because of the alliteration. But, um, but the point that he was, that, that he was trying to make was, um, you guys are saying we need to do all these things. But how do you know that any of it works? You don't have data. You don't have experiments. You, you haven't replicated your own studies about whether badges work or not. So I think there's some legitimacy to that. So as we move forward in thinking about open science, you have to be careful about not becoming your parents. <laughs> you know, it, it, by the same, you know, so we're scolding people for not doing X, Y, and Z. Right? We need to do X, Y, and Z. Right? Particularly if we're going to claim that something works. So experimental evi empirical evidence and experimentation are, are, are really important for knowing what works. Because we have theories, but, but we really need practice. Here's the other thing, and I've just learned this the hard way recently. Um, we need greater support for younger scholars. So Brendan Nyan, I don't know if you guys know Brendan Nyan. Brendan Nyan and I, three, four years ago now, put together a pre-registration study. Okay, I don't know if you know. So pre-registration, most people think about it with respect to experiments. We did it re with respect to the American National Election Studies. Long story short, the American National Election Studies, huge survey. Lots of people use it to study elections. Um, I used to run it. There's a nine-month gap between when the questionnaire is available and when the data comes out. So we thought, here's an opportunity for pre-registration. Everybody can see the questions. You've got nine months to pre-register a study. Usually with a survey, you don't pre-register, right, because you only get the data after it's out. But here's an opportunity. So we thought this was gangbusters, and, and the Arnold Foundation funds it. Like, this is awesome. So we have this thing. Uh, you get $1,000. We would give a prize. You, you send in an idea. Uh, if you send in the idea, and then we had 11 top journals in political science. You send in the idea. If one of those journals accepts your paper, we'll give you $1,000 initially, and then $1,000 to give it at a conference. And we'll give the journal uh, two or $3,000 for all the trouble that it takes to review a paper so we, we, we wanted pre-registration and pre-analysis. We, we wanted people to send in papers to journals without the data, because you could do that in this nine-month interval. So if this, is, this is the best idea ever, right? It's a survey. It's a, um, empirically, did it succeed? We got 57 entries. That's more than zero. It's less than we had imagined. We had money for, two, for 20 prizes. We gave out two. We just ended the contest a month ago. Um, is that a success or a failure? You can decide. Um, I think that we, uh, what was clear was that most of the people who entered the contest were young. And what the young people really needed, for reasons you mentioned before, were support. Right? Are you going to be the person who puts your idea on a website that eventually be public and then it doesn't get published? Right? If your uh, analysis doesn't work out, are you going to be the person who sends it to a journal? Because you've got you know, six months till you have to get a job and three years before you have to get tenure. 
I think if we were to do this contest again, we'd be giving the prizes for the submission and then putting together a support network of senior scholars to help you write papers with no results. Like, I think in retrospect, that would have been the better way to do it. Four years ago, it was just like, no, 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 if we give money, people money to do this, they'll rush to it and this is gonna be, all right. So you, empirical evidence matters. But I think the key thing is that the people my age, no offense, for those of you who are watching, uh, we're not gonna be the leaders of this. It's, it's younger people who are kind of recreating everything if we support them at every stage of the research process, right? If we who are running the journals and who, who are running the funding organizations, that's the responsibility lies with us, right? So mentoring and financial. Having said this, I, here, here's the last thing I'll say before we go to questions. Um, when was the golden age of science? When was the golden age of social science? Like if you think of an era, when was it? See, that, for me, that's a trick question, because I think the golden age of science is starting right now. There are things that we're, there are questions we're asking each other, the diversity of methods, the diversity of people. Uh, in the US, uh, the National Science Foundation, with which I'm affiliated, we have this policy about sexual harassment to try and make pe sure that people are safe and validated at all, at all parts of the scientific process. If you think of all the people we have in science, of all the methods we have, and of the conversations like this that we're having, why wouldn't the golden age of science be right now? Why wouldn't it be in front of us? But to do that, we've really got to be sure that, that you know, the methods that we're using, the things that we're publishing, have value to teachers and, and to other people. And that's the opportunity that's right in front of us. That's why uh, the transparency matters. But we can't wait for other people to do this. Ultimately, it is up to us in this room. Ultimately, the discontinuity between the past and what happens next uh, can start right here. To do that, we have to commit to greater transparency, right? Again, if we keep doing uh, privileging flashy claims and, and not really saying, what are we putting out there? Is it valid? Is it replicable? Is it true for the people who are going to use it? You know, there's this, there are these moral and ethical questions about you know, what are we doing? Um, our continuing social value in an age of fake news and chaos and misinformation depends on us being able to earn the trust of other folks, because there's, uh, there's this weird thing about the relationship between us and the public. I mentioned there were four ways of knowing, right? And sometimes some of you might say, well, you talked about religion and the same thing as science. Most of the people who use and read our work are actually never going to read our proofs, and they're never going to look at our experiments, and they're never going to look at our data. They are taking what we do on faith. What is the basis of that faith? If we don't stay true to our methods, we don't hold each other accountable to these types of things, what do we do, right? That is the basis of the faith that the cultural authority of science, the faith, the faith that people have in us, right? So I'm not saying that science is another religion, right? But I am saying that we have the capacity to do great things for people if we amongst ourselves make a commitment to tell people only things that we can validate only things that, that we can make credible and legitimate um, to large groups of people. So with that, I want to thank you. I want to thank the organizers, and we'll take questions. Arthur, thanks so much. Uh, I'm Vernon Gale from Edinburgh University. Uh, I'm not a churchgoer, but I feel like I'm in church because you're preaching and I'm a believer already. Um, but in very much the same way as I love the analogy, fish don't jump onto hooks, uh, and it'd be foolish to think so. But the thing that was going through my mind at the time is donkeys run away from sticks slightly faster than they run towards carrots. Um, so maybe you could kind of talk a, a little bit more on, on that theme about what we could do going forward. But thank you very much for what, a, what uh, is a great start to what I hope is a fantastic couple of days. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. As you wish. Sure. Hi, my name is Sevda Aslan. Uh, thanks for your talk. It was very inspiring. I'm just wondering if transparency is enough um, if you want to talk about the value of science for society, just making our questions and methods transparent um, doesn't help us finding the right questions um, and the right answers for the society. So, yeah, my question is, is it enough? 
Is it very stop or is it very very begin? Okay. Uh, thanks for your talk, uh, Ingo Rolfing from University of Cologne. Um, I mean, we are both from political science, so um, you know that open science tends to create conflicts or cleavage within the discipline. You briefly mentioned this with the Brooklyn episode, um, but you spoke about the incentives and badges, and I mean, I like this a lot, but you know there are communities within political science, so interpretivist research, who say we can't do this for philosophical or deep fundamental reasons, and it's also seen as, as you briefly mentioned, the power play maybe by quantitative people who want to dominate the discipline maybe even more in, in their perception. So this is not what you can overcome with badges, so how would you address this more cultural issue, um, not to divide the discipline further uh, than it is just, uh, divided at the moment? Thank you. All right. So thank, those, are, those are all lovely questions, so thank you so much. I'll, I'll try to take them briefly. The first question I, just, I, I think is, is about maybe the interplay between negative and positive incentives. Um, so I have a bias. Uh, my bias is I'm trying to create positive incentives, and the reason I have that bias, it might be personality, but there's also the negative, there's already negative incentives out there, right? So one of the things that people worry about when we get into the uh, replication is this idea of gotcha. Uh, so you and I publish a study, and then someone else is going to come and get us, right? And, and so the fear, particularly amongst young scholars, like, none of us are perfect. We can all make mistakes. We can all make assumptions, or we can all, you know, sort of forget to do something in our code or our design or whatever. And, and we have this culture in science now where you feel like if you're exposed as making a mistake, then the social media horde is going to come down on you and your career is over. So that is already, a, like, that's already in the culture. And so I, feel, so that I feel like negative incentives are present. And I feel like I want to try and create positive incentives, because I know that's there. Like, one of the things that I and many other people are trying to do is make, um, uh, to try and make things more collaborative. Um, when the Center for Open Science have done these big replication studies, a lot of what they've tried to do is, con like, they'll go into a field and they'll, they'll try and replicate 100 studies. And the first thing they try and do now is contact the author of those studies and say, do you want to do this with us? Right? We're, we're going to go through it the whole way. We're going to be very, but we want to make it collaborative. And there have been some cases, these are the great cases, where you have these scholars who they go through something like this and they realize they made a mistake. And they come out and they say it. Now, it's more senior scholars so far, right? Maybe that, that's because the, they're the only ones that I get to see, like they publish. But it's really amazing when a senior scholar comes out and says, we did, you know, these people did this replication and they found it, and I was wrong about this, right? That's like, that's amazing when it's collaborative. Um, so I'm trying to build things where none of us are perfect, and we, we should just, uh, you know, in science, we like to build the, the sort of this image of the great genius, and that's what we all aspire. None of us are that. No offense. No, if, if you think you are, th you know, you are. But no. But, <laughs> right, we're all like uh, very incomplete uh, human beings trying to make the best of the situation that we have. And trying to create a culture and incentives where people, where it's okay to fail, if you're failing transparently. The, in Google, you might or like or, or not like Google, but internally they have a saying called fail fast. If you're going to fail, let's do it and let's figure it out and then let's learn from it. Right? I like the idea of failing fast. I think replication and collaboration helps us fail faster because I think that's how, re, that's how knowledge actually uh, moves forward. Um, so anyways, that's, I, 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 I like uh, positive, in, in, positive incentives. So. The second question uh, is transparency enough. So I, I have a paper, if you look on my Twitter feed, I have a link to it, um, just about uh, how to improve the value of science. And there are three, th I would argue there's three things you have to do simultaneously, right? Uh, one is you have to communicate what you know effectively. And that turns out, I don't mean dumbing it down. I mean trying to find analogies, metaphors, and examples that convey the truth value of your logic so that a person walks away from an interaction with you with a more accurate understanding of the phenomena they care about than they had before. That actually takes some work, right? So one is effective communication. The second one is effective engagement. So here's, I think, the most controversial thing I'm going to say now. 
Um, I think, and this is because of my background in math, I think that science is infinite in the sense that there's an infinite number of things we could claim to know with science. So if you want a university or a federal funding agency to support you, the idea that you're going to find something new, I would argue, isn't sufficient because I think there's an infinite number of new things. So what I think people have to do is engage with stakeholders to try and figure out what are the most important things, right? Because other, I, like, I love discovery. I love basic science, right? But if you want it to be sustainable in an ecosystem where you need public support or private support to fund your universities and your salaries, there has to be something in it for them, right? So even if you're doing basic science, I think more of us, particularly older folks, uh, have an incentive or an obligation to build the bridge between the work that we're doing and society's most critical problems, right? So number one is communication, number two is engagement, and then number three is transparency. I, I would argue that today, if you, do, if you only do two of the three of those things, uh, science can't be viable anymore, right? Because if you engage and you're transparent but you don't communicate it well, what are you doing? Because people can't use it. If you, are, if you communicate it well and you're transparent but you don't engage, you might be doing great work and explaining it well and it, it helps no one, right? Or if you communicate it well and you engage but you're not transparent, then we get everybody on Twitter claiming to know everything but no, with no basis to it. I think you have to have all three. Um, the third question was the cleavage with open science and how not to divide. One of the, I think it's a really good question. I, I actually believe that there are four ways of knowing, and I don't have a universal rank ordering of them. Like you might think, oh, that's, that's sacrilege. Science must be first. No, it isn't, right? So we think about climate change, right? There, there's you know, debate about climate change is more active in some countries than others. Um, but some of the questions in climate change are about climate science. Does human industrial activity do things to temperature, right? Uh, has there been a change over time? And then there are other questions that are maybe outside the realm of science, which is, what is the obligation of a present generation to a future generation? What is the obligation of people in industrialized countries to people who live near coastlines uh, in very poor countries? Right? Science is a wonderful thing, but answers to those questions have a lot to do with morality and ethics. Right? So the point is, I think there are valid ways of knowing. I think that you know, whatever you think of organized religion, there are many parts of the world where organized religion has done things that have been helpful to people. So I think there, there's validity in all of that. With respect to, so that's the background for an answer. I think if you're claiming to do science, then uh, I think for your claim to be replicable in principle is very important because the, the, thing, the thing about science is it shouldn't depend on the culture or, or something like that. So um, different knowledge communities are going to handle that differently. There are some places where uh, forcing replication would be so costly that you would kill inquiry. And so I think a knowledge community has to be able to decide the basis for themselves. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all solution. When we did DART in political science, I mean, one of the interesting things is there were basically five principal people involved in creating DART. Uh, I was the quantitative person, and the other four were qualitative. And this was important for two reasons. One was the political situation and the discipline that we thought there'd be. But the other was, you know, I, I thought that the, well, we didn't do this on purpose, but the qualitative people had just been through a set of existential crises throughout their career where they were able to understand how this would be seen and what the incentives were. And I think that a lot of our language and a lot of our, how we thought about things was, you know, was influenced by that. So our, um, our intent wasn't to be divisive, but that doesn't matter because, you know, it, it ended, we ended up at some point, what was really neat about this is for the first five years, we had this amazing experience where we'd walk into different rooms and the, the most extreme sort of, you know, people from different, like, different disciplines would like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, but then it kind of got politicized and then it got, uh, the dart got put into a narrative that pre-existed about quant versus qual, uh, which we thought was, you know, we, we all were sort of doing gallows humor amongst ourselves, thinking that this was very strange. Um, my friend Colin Elman sort of had always talked about transparency as a meta standard, right? And the idea that we work from a, a framework, we work from a set of rules in every sort of science. 
And you know, what we're asking for is you to kind of just be clear about what your rules are and are you acting in accordance with them. Like that's the minimum standard. So that shouldn't be divisive. Um, and you know, so I, I can say, I, I, even when that got complicated, I will say that the, the controversy got the attention. Most people, nearly everyone that we saw dealt with who've written about this subsequently have been very thoughtful. You know, it's, it's, I, th I think actually for that discipline, the conversation in retrospect turned out to be very sort of healthy. I mean, I think, you know, in many of the quantitative people got, became more knowledgeable about how qualitative people uh, saw various methodological things. And within the qualitative community, uh, you know, they actually ended up doing most of the work rewriting the standards that the APSR and the AJP, the main journals in the, in the discipline used. So I, I, you know, I, I think if you, I think if, if you walk in with the idea that there are multiple ways to validate a knowledge claim and, and you, you signal that you value them and the question is how can we work together to improve the, the value of all the work, um, you know, that's, that's the approach that'll get you the farthest. That's the one we try to use. Um, yeah, so thank you for the talk. Um, so you sort of argue that um, transparency will help us achieve credibility and, and legitimacy, right? Which is nice because that way it's, uh, you sort of forego that thing where transparency is a value in itself, though I also think it should be a value in itself in a way. Um, but you then, you earlier defined legitimacy, sorry, legit legitimacy <laughs> as um, being sort of relative to recognized and standard practices. Um, and I'm just wondering, because if, if it's relative to accepted standards, then kind of anything goes and anything can be legitimate. Um, so a field where p-hacking um, is the way to go, um, p-hacking would be legitimate, right? Yeah. Um, and, but, but in that field, being transparent about p-hacking would maybe not help lo your legitimacy because maybe the way to do it is to be non-transparent about it, right? Yeah. Um, so my question is, um, don't we want something more substantive than something that's just relative to whatever is accepted in the field? Um, something like correct practices. Okay. Okay, so my name is Felix Schönbrot, so it's more, more a comment than a question. So you talked about positive incentives. And in Germany, at least seven to eight uh, psychology departments added a statement to Professor Job descriptions, stating that the department values transparent and credible research and that uh, candidates, are, um, they should write a short statement about how they pursued these goals in the past and plan to do it in the future. And I think that sends a strong signal to early career researchers that it can pay off to invest in open science and maybe have a little less quantity, but more quality and transparency. Thank you, Professor. Wonderful lecture. My name is Petlu Surova. I was just wondering if we should uh, also um, extend this quest for transparency and openness, uh, not uh, only on the process, uh, how we uh, end up with the claims that we made, but also how we get the grants uh, that actually end up with, uh, that, uh, how we get the grants for our research that I wanted to say because I'm coming from uh, Slovakia and in uh, southeastern Europe uh, there is very uh, big uh, untransparency in getting uh, grants so should we be also honest or should we be more critical to the colleagues that we know that got uh, grants in a very um, uh, untransparent way uh, should there be I don't want to say allowed to publish, but at least uh, somehow address this problem. Because this is, uh, I don't know how you are familiar uh, with the situation, but in Slovakia we have like 600 millions and more went for research and innovation <laughs> in, to the companies that they never had re nothing to do with research. But actually they hired researchers from academy to do that for them. And academics were quiet, so they get some crumbs from those millions and they were happy. So I was just wondering, maybe should we also, we should speak about that, how we get money for the things that we do and then how we made the claims based on 
uh, not so f get based on not yeah. very uh, fair way of getting that money. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't Thank know it was that clear. Thank you so much. All right. Well, let me. Uh, these are great questions. Let me address the comment first, since it's easiest. I did not know about this this statement. I think that's great. Uh, so I, I I completely endorse that. I I think that that that's a really uh, great thing. Uh, so you asked, uh, could we have something more substantive as the basis of legitimacy? Um, we need it. Yeah. So um, so a question I think is. You know, another way to think about it is what would count as not legitimate? Right? What would you know? It, it, what, what would count as is not legitimate? Um, I, I'm the problem with asking three questions. I don't remember. I, I wrote notes on your, your your question. I don't remember the exact sort of essence of it. Like, I'm not concerned about relativism in science. Like, I'm not a post-structuralist or anything like that. But but most. Language and conceptual frameworks are necessarily relative, right? That is, when we um, say that uh, something is or something is not, it's usually relative to a counterfactual than we can imagine, right? When we categorize things, we are um, creating, a, we usually create sets of categories, right? I mean, the, me the difference that, the reason that we could sustain multiple languages around the world is because there's not just one way to categorize phenomena. There are lots of different ways to categorize phenomena. So, rel so you can't get rid of relativism in, in science, right? Um, so what part? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's more because. Oh, it is okay. Sorry. Um, so it's more because you said that um, legitimacy is is relative to accepted standards, oh, right. right? So. Um, and I think that, you know, it's fine if this, like, well, it's not, it's not fine, but it can happen that a field standard is oh, that, right. that, I don't know, people don't really understand how null hypothesis significance testing works, but that doesn't make it correct or legitimate to, yeah. to not understand it and to do it wrong. That's the part I forgot. So you were saying, like, couldn't p-hacking be legitimate, right? Well, it is, it, it, according well, to that. Condition. So this is, like, so I'll, let me say something controversial to get to this. I actually have no problem with p-hacking as long as you tell me that you did it, right? I mean, if we, it, one could say, I had a data set and I really wanted to find out that being born in May led to intelligence and I ran 500 equations and one of them showed that it did and I am showing it to you now. I ran 499 others that didn't do this. If you tell me that, then when I read the one, I have a context for it. The problem with the, in the literature is people say, I had a thought, truth revealed itself to me, and I am putting it in this paper for you, right? And so the others are, are being, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure. So what, what would the alternative, as I'm trying to under, I feel like I understood the question the first time, and now I'm, I'm getting a little lost. So what would be the alternative to an accepted standard? I mean, it, like we could have a new standard. Is, that, is it the newness or the oldness? Or? Um, well, I mean, the, the new standard then also wouldn't work anymore. It wouldn't work if you yeah. say that it's the accepted standard if the new standard is the new standard that's just starting out, right? Yeah. So I'm saying that it probably makes sense to talk about some form of relative accepted standard, yeah. but you, you kind of also want to have sort of basic rules of how the methods work that people yeah. are using, whether or not they understand how, how they work. Yeah, and I think... Right, because then, because then like, otherwise you would, you would say that even if people don't understand how something works, yeah. if everyone doesn't understand how it works, it's still legitimate to do it that way. Yeah. And that is... A, it would, a strange conclusion in my yeah. Opinion. So I think you know one of the things. Here, here's a different way to think about it. Like, what does it mean to be rigorous? Like, we one of the things that we uh, talk about as a as a positive attribute of research is that it's rigorous. What does it mean to be rigorous? Right. With rigorous, it means we have some set of rules about how we take phenomena in the world 
and turn it into observations, how we take observations and turn them into categories, how we take categories and analyze the categories, and how we take analyses and interpret them. So we all go through those steps. World, observation, analysis, uh, interpretation, right? So we can be rigorous in, with different combinations of how we turn things into a category, how we analyze categories, how we interpret things. We can be rigorous in different ways, right? So as we were to, with, with, with your question before, a qualitative person who's doing an ethnography can be very, very rigorous. And the way that they show their rigor is they say, we have a way of taking phenomena and, and drawing an understanding from them. So the critical thing for um, the, the knowledge claim to have currency, to have meaning beyond a particular context or individual, is to be able to lay out the set of kind of methodological rules, like how I turn, you know, what counts as a category, what doesn't count as a category, what counts as a valid inference, what doesn't count as a valid inference. And then what I do in my paper is I show that I'm operating with respect to those rules, and when I do that, I produce an outcome. So that's what happens in mathematics, right? Mathematics is infinite, and when I do a proof, I, I say that a certain part of the world can be represented by a certain mathematical construct, right? And, and that's part of the rigor then becomes, if you allow me to do that, then I take laws of logic that were established three or 400 years ago, I do those operations on the initial things and I come out with a conclusion. You could think my conclusion is completely nuts, but you might be able to see that I was rigorous with respect to the rules of mathematics that allowed me to do that, and you might, even, this is, you might even see it's legitimate. You can say, it's completely crazy that chickens speak French on Tuesday, but I can see that you did a proof that actually produces that result. Right? So that would make it legitimate. You don't have to believe it. Right? So legitimacy, that's why I made a distinction between legitimacy and, credi leg legitimacy and credibility. But it's that you can see the process, but there has to be a process. Right? Yeah, I think, I think actually, so. Probably my actual problem with this is that I don't agree that transparency is the way to get to legitimacy because, if, because I, I agree that legitimacy has something to do about um, how, how you do stuff. Yeah. Um, but transparency is what has to be one of those accepted standards that make what you do legitimate, right? Because not every field has... Uh, okay, you look confused. <laughs> no, I think transparency um, well, is a path me, to legitimacy. Yeah. Yeah, but... But then again, you have that, you, you, like, what about a field where um, part of the accepted standards is to be covert about what you do, right? And yeah. then transparency, right? So can you, yeah, can you see, think, can you see, can you see the tension there and then it doesn't really make sense. So I think it has yeah. to be more fundamental than that. If we, if we take science as being intersubjective, if science is producing intersubjective knowledge that doesn't depend on your cultural affiliations, personal experience, or metaphysics, Right? then I think saying that there's a part of science where you're necessarily covert, it's a contradiction. Right? I mean, that's yeah. the point where, right, so I think that's... Right, we're, so, we're so, so transparency is more basic than that. Transparency is sort of yeah. so yeah. fundamental, yeah. sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I just, there was the... There was the, the so much confusion there. Yeah, there was the other question just about transparency in terms of funding. I think that's very important, knowing where money came from. If, knowing where, knowing where money, if that's what, knowing where money came from, um, it's not that money necessarily corrupts, right? It doesn't have to, but I think that, uh, again, I don't know the, the laws in various countries. I, for, even before I got involved in this type of transparency, I thought it was essential that if you've, if you've taken money from a particular organization for research, you should say that. And then you could say, well, you took money from the oil com company, obviously you don't like the environment. You know, if I've laid out a proof or an experimental design and it's true for someone who is the biggest environmentalist ever, then I may have taken money. I didn't take money from an oil company, but if I had, as long as I've done the design that way, you should see that the design is true even if you don't like oil companies, right? I think if you don't do that, there's a pro you, then, then there's a problem, right? So is that... Yeah. 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 I haven't thought through the illegal part. <laughs> yeah. Oh. 
Yeah. I, yeah, I, I'm not, there was a lot in there. I, I think you should cite the source of your money, even if it's illegal. Uh, but, I, but I don't know, but you know, so the question is, would we want to publish something if the money came from an illegal source? Um, you know, I'll just, I'll give you an extreme case. If what you published was the key to saving somebody's life, I would want to publish it, right? I mean, I, I, that maybe there's a, I'm not think, I don't, under, I haven't thought through all the counterfactuals, but when I think about rigor mortis or the experiences I've had in countries where, you know, someone has asked me a question and the lives of tens of thousands or millions of people would depend on it, if I could validate the method, if I could validate, if I knew that the data wasn't manufactured, right, if, like, all the kind of normal things, if I validated it as science, and like, yes, it came from the devil, but, you know, uh, the angel replicated it, uh, then I'd say, right, I think I, I would, I would uh, put it that way, but I haven't thought through all of the, it's probably more complicated than that. Hey, uh, my name is Jürgen Schneider. I'm from the University of Tübingen, and uh, I do a research in teacher education. And we observe that uh, the student teachers um, perceive uh, researchers as high in expertise but low in integrity, even if they make the same claim as uh, somebody from practice, like a teacher. Um, so, just imagine if all our researchers would engage in open science practices. My hypothesis would be that um, the integrity perception would go way up. But then again, I thought, um, how will the student teachers know? Probably within 10 or 15 years, like the word will spread. But is it also up to us um, to spread the word that we're all engaging in open science practices? Or who's... Uh, responsibility is it and how might we do it like in less than 10 or 15 years? So I'll, I'm going to say something that you're, you might not want to hear, but it's, it's my most honest assessment. I think that the public consequences of a move to open science for our collective reputation is likely to be U-shaped. So right now, part of the problem is we tell the world that we're magical wizards. Right? that we have magical powers and we discover things and we never make mistakes, right? We always know. Like, that's part of this ethos, right? That's part of what feeds... So that's how we present ourselves. Or, even if we don't present ourselves that way, the news only runs with our flashy results and when we get null results, nobody, nobody publishes it. So the world knows us through our flashy results. If we start having greater commitments to transparency and what that shows is that we're imperfect, because we are, there are going to be some people who are like, they're not wizards, right? Uh, why should I believe them? But I think that if the narrative that comes out is, we're not wizards, but we are working very hard and collectively and aggressively to make the best possible inferences from the data that is available, and that is our commitment, right? That is fundamentally what we are, right? then right, what happens is, is people will know that we don't always get it right, but that we're trying to. That we are not trying to go on Twitter every five seconds and draw attention to ourselves with a flashier claim than we had yesterday, which is what most of pop culture is trying to do. Right? So I think that if we get this right, right, within some period of time, people can see us as legitimate, right? because they're like, you guys follow, you guys are trying to get it right. Right. That is what you're paid to do. That is what your reward system is, is that you are trying to get it right. You don't always get it right, but you're trying to. You're not social climbing. You're not trying to draw attention to yourselves. I mean, we have some people in my discipline who have made uh, a big presence for themselves on social media. Some of them do it through talking about rigorous science, some of it doing by making flashy claims about politics that don't necessarily follow from the science. Right? That's a, that's part of the problem, right? But I think if, if, pe if our reputation is that we are the most aggressive people in society in trying to reconcile what we say with our evidence, right? That's a good reputation to have. That's, that's when people, so I think that's how the, the you comes back up. Yeah, 
thank you. Um, so if I'm not wrong, you might correct me then. I think it all started at least start with um, U.S. Congress cutting down on funding for the social sciences by the NSF. At least there's a coincidence in terms of time. And there were once attempts, or actually it was done, that um, public funding by the NSF for political science was uh, suspended for a short period of time. Um, so I think this is one response to this, to be more transparent, because to be more legitimate. So are there any, any indications that it helps politically? I mean, there's a lot of science skepticism, so is, it, is there other studies on this, or is your own personal impression that it helps politically? So um, in terms of the causal argument, the, the conversation about DART started before the funding lapse, but they, are, you know, they, they were co, they, they came at about the same time. Um, you know, the, just part of the political, part of the reason that, that political science gets in trouble politically is that sometimes it is seen as partisan, right? And in the United States, sometimes it's not just seen as partisan, it's seen as always supporting one party in particular, right? And so that's where the animus, that's where a lot of the animus comes from. Political science doesn't have to be that. It's not inherently made for that, but that's where the, the political problem comes from. I think where the reputation changes for political science is when it, in other disciplines, is when it leads to actionable outcomes, when people see that research in political science has been critical for things like security and, and safety and the more effective and efficient provision of critical public services. And, and people can see, oh, you guys help do that, right? You guys help hospitals run better. You guys help, um, it, there, there's been this great research in the US the last couple of years about how to, how to provide information during disasters, natural disasters, hurricanes, that has been very influential, that has been put into action very quickly. And that's, the, so in the political context, examples tend to work better than abstractions, so that's been more helpful than the transparency. Having said that, part of the reason that those studies, I think, have had such an impact is because most of the scholars doing the disaster research are into the transparency things, are, do, are being very replicable, are being very careful about how they do things before they make claims, which is one of the reasons that why, unlike rigor mortis, when you bring these ideas to market, they actually work, as opposed to, to failing. So I think replicability is, is a big part, ultimately, in creating scientific claims that are of value to the people trying to use them. Ha, ha, ha.